Uh, and certainly I, like I'm sure everybody in this room uh, and anybody listening, has, have watched the developments in Iran over the last several months. Uh, and I am sure that those will continue. And I think we just need to be mindful, obviously, of those events, of, those, uh, of, of what's going on there. Uh, and clearly the, the need to continue to, I think, uh, aggressively address the nuclear, potential nuclear weapons issue uh, internationally. There are discussions right now of uh, additional sanctions uh, and, and to uh, continue uh, where possible to engage uh, and have a dialogue. I talked about the lack of trust between the United States and Pakistan built very well on that 12-year gap. Uh, which we're renewing. And so we're four or five years back into establishing, working to establish that trust. Um, we've got a relationship with Iraq that goes back uh, about six years now to 2003 as we look for a long-term relationship with Iraq. When I'm in Afghanistan, I get the same question asked as when I'm in Pakistan, which is, are you going to leave us again? Because they remember very well that we have uh, in the past. Uh, and so there's a trust issue there. There's uncertainty through uh, Afghan Afghanistan, Afghanistan's eyes as to whether or not we'll stay. Uh, and, uh, and so there's a trust problem there and a relationship building requirement there as well. And then when I come back to Iran, you know, we haven't had a relationship with Iran since 1979. Uh, and so building that kind of relationship and what does that mean uh, and, it, and I speak to the difficulty of the other relationships and look at what 30 years potentially can do. Uh, so there's an awful lot of both concern, potential, uh, and, uh, and I think um, focus that needs to be sustained with respect to Iran and that part of the world. And we have great friends in that part of the world, uh, allies who've supported us and who are very anxious to continue to support us and to see uh, stability there, uh, particularly in the Gulf area, and not see it, uh, not see it uh, break out into any kind of conflict. Um, briefly, I talk about uh, the, what I call the best military I've served with since 1968, and that's our young men and women who serve right now. Extraordinary people who've, uh, who've sat, paid the ultimate sacrifice, who've been wounded, uh, and whose lives have changed forever, who have families that have been uh, unbelievable in terms of their support, without whom we wouldn't be close to where we are in either one of these two fights. Um, uh, and, uh, and to whom I believe, particularly for those who've given so much, you know, we owe an eternal debt. And it's, a, it's the kind of thing that we need to focus on, I think, as a country to make sure that those who sacrifice so much uh, are well cared for, not just by the Department of Defense or the VA uh, when they return, but literally by uh, communities throughout the land. Uh, they, have, they have gone to war, sacrificed much, done what we have asked them to do, uh, and we owe them uh, a, a great debt, uh, not just of gratitude. We need to ensure that their American dream still has a future. And it's pretty simple. They want to go to school. They'd like to get married and have kids. They'd like a job. And they want to own a house. It's not complex. It's just the path has changed. Um, uh, and then speaking to the force, which is uh, we're about to start deploying our major units for the fifth long deployment. Uh, and if you start in 2001, 2002, uh, and you, the way I tell this story is if I'm a 10 year old uh, in 2002, and my father went off to war, uh, and he's now coming up on his fifth major deployment, and I just went off to college. Uh, and think about the impact of that on a family uh, and the extraordinary strength of our families to ba basically be able to uh, absorb that. They have paid a huge price as well. Um, and, uh, and, and so I'm very mindful of the stress. Uh, we're cons obviously extremely concerned about the increase in numbers of suicides, um, the, the kinds of uh, other pressures that our members are under, and we've really taken significant steps to try to address those. But uh, the, the operational tempo, certainly over the next couple of years, is not going to put us into a position where we're going to be home twice as long as we are deployed. And that's our goal. 
the Marine Corps actually be there in about a year. Uh, but it'll be it'll probably be two, two and a half, three years before the Army is, based on ex expectations for deployments right now. So they've sacrificed tremendously uh, and performed exceptionally well. They are resilient, both in the on the military side and the family side, um, and uh, they have become the and that family piece has become much, uh, much more integral to our readiness than it ever has been, and it needs to be that way. Uh, for uh, for the future, <coughs> the last area I just talked briefly about is it's uh, there's the rest of the world uh, out there as well, uh, and and it's not going away, and we need to I think continue to be engaged and involved, uh, whether it's uh, in our own hemisphere, which I often speak to, uh, uh, certainly the very visible challenges that uh, exist in our uh, southern neighbor Mexico uh, and in Latin America, and I was raised. Uh, someone that was trained to look east and west, even being raised in Southern California. I didn't look south very much. Uh, and yet, in the global world that we're living in right now, I think we have to focus more and more there uh, as well. Uh, so there are, there are challenges associated with Latin America. Certainly the emergence uh, of China uh, and what does that mean. And the economic, and I pay a lot of attention to the economic engines, whether it's China or India or Europe uh, or us or Brazil. Uh, and, and what does that mean to the future? Because I think in the long run, it's going to be those engines that really drive outcomes. Um, and so it's important that we uh, pay a lot of attention to what's going on in other parts of the world. We stood up last, uh, I guess about a year and a half ago now, AFRICOM, uh, in, uh, uh, for the uh, sole purpose of being able to focus our engagement strategy from the military perspective on Africa, which is a wonderful continent. Of, uh, of, of great resources, wonderful people, and huge challenges, whether it's famine or disease. Uh, uh, and, I, and I think the, the world needs to be engaged there. So, uh, and, and then as I look to the rest of the world, I also try to keep my head up and look to what is, what does the United States military look like after these two wars? Uh, and uh, I always worry about fighting the last war, and for where we're going, you know, these will be the last wars, and how much of this is relevant for the future, uh, and what kind of training, equipment, uh, people, what's the size of the force, uh, and what our, what our readiness requirements will be, and where we'll be operating is very much on my mind as well. And it's pretty difficult sometimes to pick out in that, in that uh, crystal ball exactly what's going to happen. We don't have a very good track record for predicting, uh, but a balanced force uh, that is ready and trained and able to uh, adapt uh, uh, very rapidly to uh, emerging circumstances is absolutely critical. And I think we're going to need to be as a force, uh, I've, I've used the characteristics of our special forces. We're going, to do, we're going to need to be lighter, lethal, adaptable, flexible, uh, uh, more timely, more, uh, a, a, an ability to match the speed of war, uh, which I think we have achieved in the current fight. Quite frankly, we were way behind uh, when these wars started, and we've now achieved that, but we've got to get ahead of it. And that doesn't even look at other possibilities uh, that are significant, uh, for instance, in space, in the cyber world, et cetera. So, as was indicated in the introduction, we, we, lived in, we live in times that are enormously challenging. Uh, I want to reassure you that, that uh, uh, what I said before is fundamental to me getting up every single day. This is the best military we've ever had. Uh, and I have great confidence in them. Uh, but it's, but I'm also, we're also living in a time where it's not all about the military. Uh, there's, uh, the military would like to be the supporting uh, entity uh, and to lead in our policy, to, to be a supporting uh, part of our overall policy globally, and certainly not, in, not engaged from the standpoint of conflict, but engaged from the standpoint of being preventative so that, in fact, these kinds of conflicts don't break out. 